Hello and welcome to another session of Communication Law, Ethics and Diversity. I'd like to start today's session off with a brief video from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, since I believe it establishes really well the foundation for what we're going to look at today, which is prior restraint. So let's look at the video together. The mission is in our name, the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press. It is our ambition to be the indispensable nonprofit legal services organization in the country, protecting journalists, the public's right to know, and the First Amendment. The Reporters Committee really tries to be a one-stop shop for journalists when it comes to their legal needs. The piece that people see the most, that's the most visible, and, and ultimately um, the most urgent and important is the, the work we do um, in courtrooms and in legal briefs. What the Reporters Committee does in the production of these briefs is it provides the, the education and the background and the, uh, and the support for the legal arguments for judges to rely on. It can be really helpful to have our CFP weigh in as amicus and put together these big media coalitions to tell a court it's not just this one news organization that cares about this case, it's the news media across the country. The Reporters Committee attorneys will represent journalists in federal and state public records litigation. We provide guides like the FOIA wiki to help journalists understand their rights under the law. And we do trainings in newsrooms all around the country. The Reporters Committee is a lifeline for people like myself, independent journalists who don't necessarily have access to lawyers or legal representation. I didn't know anything about the Reporters Committee until I was sued for defamation uh, for $5 million. I think it really highlights exactly why the Reporters Committee is so important because we were able to step in and offer Jose pro bono legal representation. Working with the lawyers of this organization was amazing. You're talking about lawyers who really understand journalism and who understand the mission and what's at the heart of what you aspire to do. Supporting journalists, working journalists throughout the country, I think that's the key thing that we do, uh, I think, better than anyone. The Reporters Committee has a 24-7 hotline and we take requests via both phone and email. There are so many reporters in need and they don't always know what question to ask or how to ask it. They just sort of know that they have a problem. So we really do get questions from all across the country and across the world even when it comes to reporters' rights under United States law. Now more than ever, people are seeing the power of journalism and how journalism can be used as a tool uh, to ensure that the public is informed. If you look at just the cases we've been involved in in the last year or two, you can really see in a very real world, practical way how the work we do impacts the ability of reporters to do their jobs all over the country. When we have a successful lawsuit that gets them records or gets them access to a court hearing or court documents, getting to see the fantastic reporting that comes out of that is the most exciting feeling in the world. Nothing gives us as much pleasure as when we see our work pay off in the journalism and we see an article published or a story broadcast, for us, that is the big payoff. So I should let you know that the Reporters Committee became very necessary years ago for tech journalists as a result of those particular infringements on their freedoms consistent with their First Amendment rights. And so you would find that in many instances, there is what uh, was described as pro bono types of assistance given to those journalists who find themselves under fire or under the microscope of those who may be in power and may attempt to issue or uh, raise lawsuits, bring up lawsuits against them for um, different types of um, issues such as defamation of character and the like. And so it is necessary that I lay that foundation for you today as a result of what we're going to be taking a look at, and it's really consistent with two very early cases in the history of the US press relations with the government, which has been sensitive not just today, but years ago. First, it's Mayor versus Minnesota, that case that happened in 1925, and of course, the New York Times versus the United States case of 1971. Now, I'm going to share my slides with you, but this is not meant to regurgitate what you've already got there on B12. You've already got the slides but I'd just like to use the time to go over with you some of the major high points 
of today's session pertaining to higher restraint. Now, the question you may ask is, what is this thing called prior restraint? What constitutes prior restraint? It is essentially the prevention of the publication of material that do not receive First Amendment protection before they're published. And so what you will find happening is that reporters will find themselves really in courts. Um, in some cases, their editors are getting court orders for a stop publish or a stop publication notification coming from the courts as a result of something that may be in the vicinity of maybe a government um, issue, maybe it's successes that they're reporting on, maybe it's some sort of scandal. And so, you know, maybe it's of a political or legal nature. Invariably, you will find that a lot of times, you know, reporters who are seeking the help and the assistance, they may have to turn to, you know, lawyers. And that's the reason why you have some um, establishments. These establishments, they do have legal counsel there to make sure that they're not necessarily um, in the bad books, first of all. And of course, they're within their rights, their First Amendment rights to go ahead and to publish. But it's really the prevention of publication of material that is not, not necessarily considered protected under the First Amendment. And so what you will find those in power resorting to is filing a restraint to block the prevention. And of course, this is largely considered censorship in the context of reporting consistent with the rights of reporters to provide information to the public. And so Nair versus Minnesota, this particular landmark case in 1931, really um, with the gag order that was issued in the Nair versus Minnesota case by the state of Minnesota, raise questions about the constitutionality of the courts really applying a gag or a restraint on reporters and on their ability to inform the public about issues of a national interest. And so just to give you some background about Nair versus Minnesota, after its ratification and until the early 20th century, the First Amendment really protected citizens from federal government censorship directly. But this did not stop the government from really censoring newspapers that were circulating at that time in the history of the US. And so abolitionist newspapers in the South and pro-slavery newspapers in the North prior to the Civil War faced extensive censorship from the state and the federal government. And this is how the Nair versus Minnesota case came into being. And what happened really, this whole process of censorship and regulation continued way into the 1930s, but just around 1931, this is when the Supreme Court got light and wind of this particular case of Nair versus Minnesota. And they looked at the 14th Amendment requirements and they applied that particular First Amendment protection to um, actually hear the case of Nair versus Minnesota. And so what prompted the case in the 1931 situation is the fact that newspapers were frequently subject to official approval before publication, like I said, censorship, wanton censorship, and publishers had to show very good motives and justifiable ends for what they were about to print. And if they could not do so, then the newspapers were censored and perhaps stories were actually deleted that were found to be disfavorable to those in power. And so when it comes to publishing things that were considered to be obscene or lewd or lascivious or malicious or what they deemed to be scandalous or defamatory, it was really treated as a crime. So you can imagine the situation that Nair found himself in, in that particular case that really started off sometime around 19, 1920s with what was known as a scandal sheet in Minneapolis. So if you know your journalism history, if you're a journalism major, if you're a communication and media studies major, let's go back in time to when that particular era of sensational news or what they call muckraking or yellow journalism really emerged, um, you know, back in the 1920s, you know, it was a situation where it was a scandal. And so what was happening was a whole lot of exposés on corruption. It was, um, you know, an unabashed criticism of power of those who are in authority, who were found to be um, mis misusing and abusing their power, which is exactly why the First Amendment um, was there and the Freedom of the Information Act and all of these particular acts and statutes were enacted so that the, the public were supposed to be informed about the, the things that were happening that were against um, the, the, the power um, structures of the society. And so 
Because of the regular criticism of elected officials who were accused of dishonesty, this is what prompted the case of Nair versus Minnesota. Um, clearly, uh, he was bringing elected officials into disrepute. And of course, bringing those types of issues into the public domain um, cast a bad shadow on those in authority at that time. And so what Nair was actually saying in his papers were that was that the Jews were the power brokers in society and that the police were actually taking bribes. I'm sure for those of you who are looking at this lecture, you may say to yourself, well, this is nothing new because we're getting a resurgence of these types of issues happening in society. Or you may be pondering, I had no idea that this, these types of things were happening that long ago. Yes, it was happening that long ago and you had one newspaper, a few of them who were not ashamed, they're not afraid to actually call out those excesses or to call out things that, 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 that seem to be inimical to good governance in society. And so the government really stopped the newspapers from publishing in the 1920s. And of course, 1925 is when Nier got his particular day in court um, on the basis of the Minnesota law. So we might call it draconian, but what the court said really is that prior restraint and publication or censoring was the essence of the thing that we were supposed to be stopping with the First Amendment. It was censorship, all right? So why are you even stopping the newspaper from going to publication on something that is possibly correct? or it's not necessarily false, but it's you know some sort of um, excesses or it's some sort of issue that the public is really supposed to be aware of in the context of not just how crime and security are usually there functioning or who is actually running the society, but it's the whole check on authority and those in power. So even in cases where print statements could be punished after the fact for libel, um, neither federal nor state governments we're supposed to actually stop the publication of materials in advance, but this is exactly what was happening here in the state of Minnesota. So the court really cautioned that it's really not constitutional to stop a newspaper from going to print unless it's a war season, unless it's wartime. And of course, you're actually exposing the particular plans and strategies of the United States in terms of recruitment or where they're going to be sailing or setting um, you know, foot in terms of enemy territory and stuff like that. So that was the court's argument. Only in cases of wartime, that's the only way you can actually say to a newspaper editor, do not go to print because you're going to be exposing us. You're going to be exposing the nation to a national security risk, so to speak. So Nair was one of the most important cases concerning freedom of the press that the court ever decided in the history of the United States following that First Amendment. And so prohibition against prior restraint hit at the very heart of the First Amendment principles. And of course, it still applied to states as well as the federal government. So what happened when the, you know, the court in Minnesota passed the gag law, um, there was a split in the judgment. You found that, you know, six, you know, were four and three were sort of divided. Judges were acting without a jury at that time and they could start, stop a publication of any single newspaper. So if back then, you know, if the Atlanta Journal Constitution existed or a newspaper that had to do with, um, I would say, things around, you know, slavery, anything could have been stopped, notwithstanding the factual nature of the content that was being published in that particular newspaper. But they were looking for things around obscene or lewd or lascivious or scandalous or defamatory. They were saying, you know what, if it really meets that particular category, we can stop them. But the law provided that a periodical could be permanently enjoined from future publication if they found all of these different attributes in the context of what they found to be lewd or obscene or lascivious, etc. So this was a draconian piece of law that was passed in Minnesota in 1925. And that was the same law that was applied to Nier in his particular case when he took the case to the Supreme Court. Now, you know, of course, the lawmakers in Minnesota, they were overreaching and they were trying to, uh, in their attempts to stop what they call yellow journalism. That's the reason why they issued or they came up with this gag law. And of course, generally regarded approvingly, the American public wanted to see exactly how is it that we have the First Amendment in place and then we're allowing the Minnesota gag law to stand um, against what was constitutionally um, you know, not set up to, to stop reporters or, or press from going forward. 
So the law was applied to the Saturday press, which was the press that um, there was directly responsible for. It was a weekly um, publication. And of course, it was a whole lot of controversy that you would have found inside that particular publication. Anything from crime to corruption. So, you know, he would have been someone who would have been posting or he would have been, you know, framing issues around police brutality or excesses. This would have been Nair if Nair were the person who was running the newspapers right now based on what is happening. I could imagine somebody like Nair printing and publishing issues about, you know, crime and security and stuff like that in and around the state of Atlanta and all the places. But, but the thing is that whenever you see, um, you know, their attacks against the press, you will hear that, well, I believe that they're either leftist or they're to the right, meaning they're either liberal or they're conservative, they're Democrat or they're Republican. But Nair had no particular allegiances when they found um, out about his background. He was described as disreputable in the sense that he was anti-Catholic, he was anti-everything under the sun in the context of his particular style of writing and publication. So he did not have some sort of ax to grind when it came to the political rhetoric or when it came to anything that had to do with religion or morality, all right? He just wrote things as he saw and of course, the American Civil Liberties Union liked this about him because for them, this is somebody who's actually going against the grain of society, so to speak. All right. So his defenders were really concerned that, you know, what you're trying to do to stop his newspaper from going to print was really prior restraint and it was against the Constitution. It was an attempt, in essence, by government to prohibit the information that was going out that really made them look very bad. And of course it was censorship and really something that was not supposed to happen in the context of the freedom of the press and the freedom to speak. But after the Supreme Court upheld the injunction preventing the publication, the conservative Chicago publisher, Colonel Robert McCormack really, you know, he said, you know what, I'm going to put forward the American Civil Liberties Union to appeal this case. And so the case went straight away to the Supreme Court again the American Civil Liberties Union went in there and they really took the Supreme Court to task. And so at the end of the day, what you found happening was that they were saying that you're actually um, eroding the liberties that were enjoyed by the press and by the public in the context of the First Amendment. Why are you then, um, you know, taking somebody to task for bringing to light the excesses, the corruption that was actually taking place in government? And so they are saying that due process is not given to someone who is willing to let the public know what is happening in the context of the freedom of, the spe of, of speech, so to speak. So the 14th Amendment was really what was cited in this case and it was seen as an invasion of state action. The overbreadth and the overreaching of the state's arm as a result of the rights and privileges that were supposed to be enjoyed. Now, this particular judge, Judge Butler, he argued otherwise. He says that for the majority's decision, um, it would put unprecedented restrictions on states, um, which had traditionally used their police powers to promote public welfare. And of course, he also said that prohibiting publication of scandalous or defamatory claims, such as those alleged by nearest newspaper, the Saturday Press, fell within this particular purview. So in examining the case, you know, there was quick sort of judgment. And of course, what they use in this particular situation was the fact that, why are you trying to actually remove the power from the press as watchdogs by bringing this case before us, all right? So there was this connection between what was supposed to have followed later years to come in terms of the 1971 case with the New York Times versus the United States. And so very early, in the 1930s, the Nair versus Minnesota case set up the arguments around the freedom of the press and the rights of the press to actually be able to let the American people know what was happening at the level of government and where those missteps were actually occurring. And this here has to do with government's undertaking of the war in Vietnam that happened. And of course, this caused the undoing um, of, the, of, 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 of the Nixon administration, all right? So just a bit of background to what happened in the New York Times case versus the United States in 1971. Um, in 1967, the then Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, commissioned a secret government study 
on the, the American involvement in Vietnam. And so when that study was completed in 1968, it was classified because remember, this was a secret study, all right? Quite a compact document of findings, but in every single jurisdiction and every single, I would say, organization, there is always someone who is likely to have a friend in the press. There's always likely to have someone who's going to be an inside person. Um, reporters are you know, bound by obligation and ethical um, principles to protect their sources. So you may find some of them would have said, well, according to an anonymous source. So I, I, because the source trusted the reporter, that's the reason why they went to them with the leak, so to speak. So the classified document actually was leaked to Daniel, leaked by Daniel Ellsberg, um, a RAN Corporation employee. It was leaked to the New York Times reporters um, who got their hands on it. And what did they do? They published it. And this is what was called the Pentagon Papers, all right? And so the Pentagon Papers, of course, today they're all declassified, but the Pentagon Papers really came up um, for a lot of discussion. And that's what caused the famous Watergate scandal to break out in the context of what happened with America's invasion of Vietnam and the war in Vietnam and stuff like that. So after the first three installments of this particular publication of the Watergate papers, then they uh, you know, really placed the, the Nixon administration squarely at odds. And of course, quite a lot of wrongdoings were cited in the papers, missteps occurred uh, before they went to war. National security concerns were also raised um, by the publication of the newspapers and stuff like that. And what the Nixon administration sought to do was to actually bar New York Times from further publication because it was an embarrassment at that time to the national administration based on what was actually brought to the public's attention um, as a result of Nixon's missteps in going or deciding to actually go to war in Vietnam. So that particular case went straight to the Supreme Court. And when the Second, Second Circuit Court really saw what happened um, in the situation of that gag order or what we call a restraining order to bar the New York, the New York Times, the Second Circuit Court really made an emergency appeal. Um, and the Supreme Court decided to hear the case very quickly. And so they issued their opinion in a matter of four days. So June 26 to June 30, and of course, 15 days and the case was actually over. And that resulted in a 6-3 decision with six of the judges ruling in favor of letting the stories go because this is a situation where it was the First Amendment right of the New York Times to actually publish the issues. They were not necessarily something that was seen within the national security interest since the war had already taken place, but they were issues or they were facts that occurred um, at the level of the analysis of the reporting in terms of the missteps um, that caused the decisions to go into Vietnam. So the paragraphs were actually laid out in the case and I'd like you to take a look at them because I'm not going to go back through um, because I'm actually, <laughs> I've, I've given you the, the slides already. And so the Supreme Court judge really, um, the judges, the six versus three, the judgments really read from this whole notion of it is really not justifiable for you to seek to gag or to restrain a newspaper when in fact there is no evidence of a, um, you know, a, an exposure to some sort of security issue. And so what the judge really said is that any system of prior restraints comes to this court bearing a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity and the government thus carries a heavy burden showing justification for the imposition. In this particular case, there was no justification, no evidence, no, no, no particular proof that if the New York Times published those particular papers known as the Watergate scandal, there was going to be some sort of threat to the US national security. So the court really ruled in favor of the New York Times continued publication of the Pentagon Papers. Um, and of course, those papers went to other newspapers um, eventually. All right. This is what Justice Hugo Black said, and I'd like you to take note of this. He said in his judgment, only a free and unrestrained press can effectively expose deception in government and, of course, reject any prior restraints on the press. He rejected it outrightly. 
And he said, really, for a free press to operate in an unrestrained manner, um, you know, it has to be truly free. And of course, it has to make it has to not have the government on its backs and think about, oh, my goodness, if I publish what is going to happen with me. In the opening, we saw that particular video from those reporters who have now pro bono um, legal counsel as a result of the excesses that are happening and that happened since 1971, as a result of those particular lawsuits that were issued against reporters who are not fully aware of how to protect themselves consistent with their First Amendment rights. And so you'll find that invariably, you know, in as much as we are living in a democracy, there are times when their, you know, reporters will actually be um, brought to the courts or editors, um, they'll be cited, um, maybe there might be attempts to do those citations in the context of the prior restraint that really should not occur, but these are things that are still happening in very free and open and quote unquote democratic societies. And so you've got a couple of judgments here. The dissent um, is actually here in terms of censorship. Um, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, you've got Justice Byron White, um, you know, just Justice Douglas, who cited the Espionage Act of 1917. He did not support the government's case. And of course, Justice Potter Stewart and Thurgood Marshall, they had separate arguments on this issue. The three dissenters, here's a point to note here, Justice Warren Berger and Justices Harry Blackman and John Marshall Harlan, they filed separate opinion against, well, what the, the six were saying. They were the six judges in the case very early on, they said that there should be no prior restraint unless there is evidence of a security breach. And of course, these three judges who dissented, they said that the case had been resolved too quickly. For them, taking just two weeks to decide on a situation where the Watergate scandal is concerned, it's something that really needs um, you know, a closer attention. And they felt it was really against the executive. Now, I should let you know, and I'm going to remind you about these particular tenuous situations, because bear in mind, don't forget that the justices and judges are appointed by the political leaders. Um, the president receives, of course, they go through some sort of hearing and they're appointed for life. And in many cases, you might find that judges who are not necessarily <laughs> appointed by, you know, the, the side that is, is, is in office, they may dissent. But I'm not sure about the background to this particular case. But a lot of dissension um, may be when the other party is in power and they may find some sort of agreement or they may agree, but judges cannot reinterpret the constitution. Where the executive is concerned, they cannot reinterpret or apply it to their own particular whims and fancies when it comes to the US constitution. The constitution remains powerful. It remains the supreme law of the land over the executive body that is in power. So every time you think about the case and you think about what is happening in this particular space here in our national system and reporting, consider how those legal cases brought against the press in the United States really have evolved over time as a, re as a result of the interpretation of the Constitution and, of course, the First Amendment protections that journalists and press people enjoy. This is not something to be trifled with or taken lightly because they're not similar to what happens in other jurisdictions. In repressive states and in states where there is an autocracy rather than a democracy, um, press freedom is not something that is enjoyed by reporters, all right? So because not every state has what is called freedom of information, that's the reason why the press freedom is not necessarily enjoyed. There is not that free freedom of speech, maybe within the constitution of those countries, and that's the reason why. So this particular case here, it, it really marked a free press victory and it was said to be, you know, free press is, is really still held in ambiguity, but New York Times versus United States, it's really regarded as a victory, so to speak. So the opinion of the judges really, you will see that it clearly states that in any situation in which the government wishes to resort to censorship generally, it faces a very difficult task in convincing the courts to issue the necessary legal orders. They have to have a preponderance of evidence beyond the shadow of a doubt that what they're trying to withhold from the public really constitutes a national security breach. All right, 
think about, I'd like you to think about any other cases that you would have seen reported recently in the last five years in the United States, whereby somebody in the executive tried to stop particular information from getting to the public's knowledge and they failed in the court as a result of those First Amendment rights and privileges um, enjoyed by reporters and stuff like that. So here's the ambiguity. Um, you know, the decision really was a critic of the First Amendment. And of course, the court's fractured majority feels to say prior restraint may never be imposed. They did not say it may not be imposed. They said it can be imposed on their national security issues, but with the evidence that is actually provided. All right. If the threat to national security can be proven, so to speak. So that, that's where the ambiguity really resides. But of course, it's very clear. And of course, they've left the decision open for government to possibly say, well, we don't necessarily like you to talk about which soldier actually went in there and fired a shot because we don't want you to name him. When in fact, the, 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 the particular officer, um, the military officer was found to be in breach of the maybe civil rights of that particular um, nation or, or country or people, all right? So censorship is it's something that I believe it's frowned upon when it comes to what the constitution says. And so in this ruling in New York Times versus the United States, the court basically established a heavy presumption against prior restraint and even in cases involving national security. And it means that, you know, they're likely to find cases of government censorship to be totally unconstitutional. And so the New York Times, like I said, it was a major victory, but we've got to remember in my very first or second class, I said that not every single First Amendment right or principle is an absolute for reporters and the press when it comes to press freedom, all right? Now, I'm saying all of this to say that there are times when prior restraint is actually allowed Evidence that the speech will cause a great and certain harm in those cases, you can have someone <laughs> hear what the speech is going to be about and they can issue a prior restraint or an injunction against that person who is going to set up that particular speech. All right. Um, when the speaker or publication clearly has engaged in criminal activity to in obtain the information, criminal activity meaning that you have breached someone's privacy, you have actually not obtained the consent to get the interview or uh, you sneaked into somebody's private space, um, that's pretty criminal. Um, you've set up hidden cameras and stuff like that. In those particular instances, prior restraint is allowed against the publication, all right? And of course, when other laws and legislations prevent or limit the speech from being made public in the sense that there's a threat to national security, and of course, laws that limit the use of copyrighted material, if you are breaching the copyright laws, which we shall speak about later in the semester, then prior restraint can be allowed because it is not your intellectual work. It's somebody else's intellectual work. And when I say here, I mean those persons who are going to be engaged in publishing somebody else's content. Now, when the police legally prevent the speech involved, when individuals conspire to commit a crime or incite violence, they're pretty much within their rights to do so if there is incitement known prior to the actual activity. All right, does this sound familiar? You can actually stop people from going ahead to form or to forge that particular little protest that they say it's a, it's a peaceful protest actually. Well, if the public authorities, the police, they get wind of the fact that you're going to actually be causing people to protest in such a way that it becomes violent, then they can stop that particular gathering. And so this is where you don't have an argument on the basis of the constitutionality of, oh, the right to protest. Yes, you do have a right to protest. We have a right to protest. But if that protest is going to lead to incitement and committing a crime, then there is clear and present danger that they need to stop. And so the need for prior restraint, all right? Now, who is bound by injunctions or prior restraint orders? Anyone. Person or publication named in the injunctive order is bound by it. So it means that the reporter can be bound by it, the editor can be bound by it, or the owner of the media establishment can be bound by it. But Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 65D also binds non-parties who act with the named parties 
as well as their successors. For instance, if the New York Times has an injunction against it, all of its affiliate publications will also have the same injunction against them. It means that they cannot publish, they cannot go to print. But if there's some sort of disassociation, for instance, the Washington Post, which published the Pentagon Papers, they were not affiliated. They're as independent as the New York Times, all right? So while the New York Times was in court with the Nixon administration, the press was still able to go ahead, go ahead and get their work done. The, the Washington Post was able to bring the issues to the public's attention to the extent that, hey, we're still getting to know exactly what craziness you did to the extent that after we published ad nauseum, you had no choice but to leave office, all right? Because the Washington Post was not affiliated in any way with the New York Times. So these are two very, very, um, I would say active um, media establishments to, you know, a part of the press in, in the very early history of covering politics in the US. And so they're pretty much still very active in terms of being watchdogs on power. So we may see some examples of this on the web, um, New Jersey's injunction on the fly in the wall for publishing stock information before the press releases were actually made public. And of course, the Second Circuit Court struck down the injunction and reversed the decision because other places were publishing the same information. So if it is that you are seeing the coverage of a story in multiple places, then, you know, again, you cannot necessarily have an injunction when it's available to the public in any event across other spaces um, online or in the newspapers printed. Um, and so WikiLeaks also, there was a case brought against WikiLeaks, but it was dismissed because there are other websites that were actually hosting the same information. So here's something for you to think about as you consider today's session on prior restraint. When is prior restraint actually allowed? We did say that the major consideration would be if there's a national security threat. There is also issues around whether you're going to be leading that particular protest action to criminal activity. And of course, if you've obtained the information without consent or you've used nefarious tactics to actually obtain the information or for instance, using somebody else's work, you're using copyrighted material and so prior restraint can be issued. So think about that in the context of your mid-semester test Think about it in the context of current cases that are occurring right now or might have occurred in the last five years as a result of gag, or we call it gagging of the press um, against or inimical to the First Amendment rights of reporters in the United States. Can you think about recent cases as well, frank, prior restraint in the national political sphere? All right, so I'd like you to think about that. Um, the cases that I noted today, you should be able to just get those cases online um, easily um, by just hovering over the cases that I've noted, or you can just have uh, you know, a fresh, I would say, type of search. Bentham Books versus Sullivan, 1963 versus Minnesota. These are all cases that are available online and the briefs are available as well. I would really urge you to read the briefs so that you can get a better understanding of what obtained historically in the context of prior restraint in the United States and the history of the press. And of course, those particular types of relationships that have evolved over time between those in power and those who are really constitutionally the watchdogs of those in power. Also, I'd like for you to watch those videos so that you can have a better grounding of what types of, I would say, attacks the press have been under historically and some of the strains and the constraints that they continue to face in the context of reporting um, the issues around national decision making and of course keeping a watch on those in authority and making sure that there is no overreach of the three branches of government. 